Now, NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio with Lee Whitting. Whether you're listening on TalkZone by podcast, through the archives of our ad-free shows on our YouTube channel, or connected through the incredible content of our Facebook page. Rarely does my birthday turn up on a show date Monday, as it has today. So I'm asking you, dear listener, to indulge me on my 81st birthday as I attempt to describe how my childhood NDE has affected my life thus far. I know my life would have turned out differently had I not drowned at age seven and been given the incredible gift of a near-death experience. The theme of this show is not entirely my own idea. Over the years, many people recently returned from their own NDEs have asked how my NDE changed the direction of my life. My shorthand response has been, well, it taught me not to be afraid of uh, dying, for one thing. And if they didn't ask more, I'd leave it at that. In retrospect, though, what sounds like a small change in perspective turns out to have had major repercussions. My pre-NDE me a child spoiled by being born first, now feeling neglected and unloved, drew enormous reassurance and confidence from that brief immersion in the reality of God's love and the reassurance of my mother's personal love for me as well. I started thinking about this recently when I realized that all our fears and self-imposed limitations stem from our brain's own cautionary fears about dying. The brain, after all, dies with the body, but get reminded by an NDE of the soul's perspective, and your life's potential grows enormously. So this show is my greatly expanded answer to that question, how did your NDE change the direction of your life? My hope is to demonstrate that when you exchange the brain sphere of dying for the reality of God's eternal love, things can change in your life as well. I believe we reincarnate from some family relationship we can't remember once we get here, so we tend to cling to family stories we are told. Reincarnation explains many things, including Bible references to why God would allow the sins of the Father to affect the following generations. For example, Numbers 14, 18 tell us, uh, The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiving sin and rebellion, Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. What seems superficially unfair makes more sense when you realize that ancestor parent from three generations back may well have been you. I think that's why many families have stories that linger from generation to generation long after those who experienced them have passed away. They remain interesting, especially if you believe we reincarnate within families and that history tends to repeat itself. If the grandmother you're living with today was your own great-granddaughter from a previous life, the roles may have changed, but personalities remain. It puts a whole new perspective on relationships when you think of the possibilities. In my father's family, a story went back to my grandfather's great-grandfather of a forester who worked in the Black Forest of Bavaria. It seems he and his dog left the family cottage one morning to walk his rounds through the woods. But two miles down the path, the dog suddenly jumped up, tugged on the forester's sleeve, and pulled him back down the path they had just come. At first, the man thought his dog had gone crazy, but at last he relented and followed the dog as it ran back to their home. As he entered the cottage, he realized the fire had just jumped from the fireplace and the dry wooden floor was in flames, but he'd arrived in time to quell the fire and save his sleeping family. All this was attributed to the psychic powers of his faithful dog, who had sensed the fire even before it started. I found this story especially intriguing as a child, and later in my life, a similar event happened to me. My wife, kids, some house guests, and my dog were still asleep when I left our farmhouse early one morning to drive the four miles into Castine Village. I was down the road about a mile when a voice in my head said, Go back now. Without a moment's hesitation, I drove back, ran into the house, 
and saw the heat from our wood stove had set my son's coat and the chair it was on on fire, and that fire was about to spread to the curtains. Grabbing the chair and a coat in my arms, I ran them outside and saved the house. My grandfather was raised Catholic, and to him, his ancestor's story seemed like a miracle. I remember him, Grandpa Nick, as tough and uh, too demanding, but he loved his dog, a Spitz he'd named Spitzy. As a young man, Grandpa worked his way from Cologne to London with a comb and clippers, cutting people's hair for a meal or loose change. As a child, I also remember dreading those clippers, painfully dull with age when Grandpa insisted on cutting my hair, but pulled it out instead. When he left Germany, his destination was Brazil, but he only earned enough to make it to Ellis Island, New York. He brought his German discipline with him, though, and vowed he'd make it here. He met his wife-to-be, Anna, a German orphan sent to America to be raised. Her lingering memory as a little girl on a freighter to this country was how someone cruelly stole the chocolate bar she'd been given as a farewell gift from the orphanage. Grandpa proposed to Anna, but told her they could not marry until he built a house and earned enough money to bring the rest of the family from Cologne. He settled in Cranford, New Jersey, got a job at the Aeolian Piano Factory, and found land on Hollywood Avenue, a dirt road near the railroad tracks with three, to, three lots, enough for his house and two more for the family. Then he went to work, earning the money to bring his parents and five siblings from Germany. He got all that done in five years, encouraged by tear-stained uh, letters from his mother in Germany, and then Nicholas and Anna could marry. <clears throat> As a child, I remember running through the backyards of the Whitting family compound, from Grandpa's house to Uncle Matthew's and then to Aunt Rose's. When my dad and his brother were still kids, they were family parties where my grandpa would play his accordion. My dad, named Christian, was the older of their two sons, and he bore the full burden of his times. He was born in 1915 in the midst of the First World War, just a few years before the pandemic known as the Spanish Flu. As a young child, Dad was once punished for speaking German in public since Germany was once again America's enemy. At 10, Grandpa took him to the Bowery, showed him the drunks and homeless sleeping on the streets, and warned him that he would become one of them if he didn't work hard. When the Depression hit and my grandfather lost his job at the piano factory, my dad worked at the post office after school and helped with the garden to keep the family fed. Grandpa had a one-car garage with a workbench filled with every kind of hand tool, and he could fix anything. The tools were harder to get to in the winter, though, because his stored car was in there up on blocks. He only used it seasonally, I guess to protect it from road salt. When I was growing up, uh, Grandma Anna still cooked on her smelly kerosene range, it was left on to heat the nearby hot water tank as well, and to keep her flat irons hot for ironing. She spent much of her time in the kitchen, scrubbing the floor, uh, uh, ironing, cooking, and listening to soap operas on the radio. I also remember the ice man bringing blocks of ice each week for their old ice box and the morning deliveries of bottled milk and sourdough rye bread. When Germany started World War II, my father joined the U.S. Merchant Marines conveying munitions and other war materials to London. On one trip, the ship just ahead of theirs was torpedoed by a German U-boat. My father, as chief petty officer and the ship's medical officer, had to watch as they sailed through a sea full of drowning Americans, since stopping to save them would have meant their ship would be torpedoed as well. I'm sure some of my father's angry self-discipline came from the PTSD inflicted on him by that war. My mom's father, William Ork, was born in New York, descended from Scottish immigrants to America whose ancestors had originally come from Norway. As a youth, he went west to live the life of a cowboy, he manned the chuck wagon while others moved the cattle. When he returned east to Cranford, New Jersey, he became a refrigerator engineer, perhaps because he'd had to deal with too much chuck wagon rotten food out west. He married Ada, an amazingly tough woman with a great sense of humor, 
who made me sing silly songs when she played the, her upright piano. Instead of soap operas, she listened to Arthur Godfrey on the radio while she made soups that guaranteed nothing in her kitchen would ever go to waste. They lived on Lehigh Avenue near the Lehigh Valley tracks running through Cranford, and during the Depression she fed many hobos who rode the boxcars and came to her back door with offers to work for food. Grandpa was a mason and grew grapes in the backyard to make wine during Prohibition. So my parents' parents lived just blocks from one another. Being in the same school district, my mom and dad met in kindergarten, went through each grade together, and married at age 23. They moved to a small apartment in Manhattan, and while he worked in accounting and went to Fordham at night, she worked as a magazine illustrator at McGraw-Hill. My mother was named Grace, and she used to tell me I was born under a sign. It seems the sign was painted on the ceiling above the delivery table at Booth Memorial, the Salvation Army Hospital in Manhattan, where I was born. The sign read, Jesus Saves, of course. I was born during World War II, in which, strangely enough, I may have participated. My growing up dreams, and uh, later on a pretty good psychic, told me my previous life ended on a battlefield. In my dream, I was a medic trying to save a soldier when my ambulance was blown to bits. Now, reincarnation or no, these dreams prompted me in middle age to become a volunteer EMT on our local amb ambulance corps. Since my father was away at the war, my mother showered me with all her concern and love. What I remember from that time in our new apartment in Yonkers was my mother's love and one toy I obsessed over. It was a brightly painted wooden rocking horse, but strangely, it never seemed bright enough to me. My major entertainment as a three-year-old was to paint that wooden horse with water. My mother would give me a little paintbrush and a bowl of water, and I would sit on the floor for hours painting the glossy reds, greens, and browns to make them glow even more. I suspect now, like many children of that age, I harbored residual memories of the iridescent place our souls dwell before we get born. Because we were alone, my mom gave me much attention and devote as much as she might just as well have been an angel to me. My mother, befitting her name, was uncommonly spiritual. A ghostly visit from her grandmother, a floating mist in the air one, in the kitchen ceiling one night, seemed to her congratulations on my birth. One adventure I remember were the times we went to visit Mom's best friend, Connie Holden, who was niece to Paul Manship, sculptor of the golden Prometheus that presides over Rockefeller Center. To get to Aunt Connie's house, we took the trolley, marvelous machines that were replaced with buses by the 1950s. My heaven on earth quickly vanished, though, when my father came home from the war. I still remember the memory of him standing at the door and the military aura that entered our lives. My mom's attention turned to him immediately, and not long after, to my two younger sisters as they were born. I learned the meaning of jealousy and depression and fear. Since I was convinced, I now played no more than a small role in my mother's subdivided life. I regressed almost immediately with crying and tantrums and scary dreams. One recurring nightmare was of me on a chessboard being pushed back, pushed to the back row where I couldn't move and couldn't escape. My dark bedroom scared me now, and I cried for a nightlight. My father was angry with me generally, which only made things worse. All he knew of fathering was what he'd learned from his own fiercely demanding upbringing. My father's incentive to work hard led him to a significant role in developing early television. He became general manager for the Dumont Television Network, the new Channel 5 in New York City. With his improved salary, he bought a tiny island on Kemah Lake in Branchville, New Jersey, and spent his weekends building a cottage there with a footbridge to the shore. My dad and grandpa would drive up to the cottage on weekends, both of them smoking cigars while I was getting car sick in the back seat. Still, I wanted to go. It was there at that lake that I drowned. Now, I used to claim that my death was merely an accident, a 
slip of the foot, a mistake of judgment. I mean, back then, whoever noticed depression in a seven-year-old? Anyway, here's what happened. I was seven and a half, not knowing how to swim, and I waded out too far. The lake bottom fell off sharply, and I slid off the ledge into deep water. I thrashed about and came up once, but then I let out a full-throated scream. The scream emptied my lungs, and I sank slowly to the bottom, choking as my lungs sucked in water. But then the miracle happened. My soul left my body, left the lake, and rose into a birch tree that stood near the door to my cottage. My mother had heard my scream, and from my perch in the tree I could see her in a red dress running out of the cottage and down to the shore to jump in, diving down to my body and pulling me up. She dragged me to the shore, threw me face down with a log under my chest, and pulled on my back, I mean pushed down on my back, trying to get the water out of my lungs. In the process, she more or less invented CPR, since the log under me did chest compressions each time she pushed. But meanwhile, I realized I was home again, home the way it should be, filled with the love of heaven. I remember seeing a light I could go into, but no angels that I recall, no beings were there to tell me what was happening. But what I was realizing as I watched my mother struggling pleading with me to come back, was the proof of love I doubted ever since my dad had come home from the war. My mom loved me unconditionally, and she was so distraught that I knew I had to stay to come back to my body. And then mom's efforts got my heart started again. Now, there is a dream or series of dreams connected with my death, for years afterward, while growing up, I had this recurring vision that I was falling away from the light down a dark tunnel. When I woke, I thought it was a memory of my sinking to the bottom of the lake, that the light was the sun on the surface and the darkness was water too deep for the light. Years later, in my 20s, I returned to the lake and dove down just to see if my dream ref reflected the reality of sunlight underwater. It did not. The sunlight spread uniformly across the surface of the lake and all the way to the bottom. There was no tunnel effect at all. So it was not until years later after that that I, in first reading about near-death experiences, that I realized the tunnel and the light were memories of where I was falling from when I returned to my body. My near-death experience was not elaborate, at least as far as I can remember. My dreams suggest I might have traveled further into the light than my perch in that birch tree would suggest, but as I say, I don't recall. What I do know is the extent to which it changed my life, primarily by removing my fear of death and my fear of not being loved, two fears that are connected to each other in remarkable ways. It pulled me out of the shell I'd been building and stirred my natural curiosity about life into a full-on drive to learn and experience more. Recovering in bed, I decided not to tell my mother what I had seen. I had felt her anxiety viscerally as she pumped on my body to get me to breathe. Her pain at that moment precluded any consideration on my part of going into the light, and my NDE reassured uh, was reassuring to me, but I, I sensed that confirming I'd died would have been devastating to her. Fact is, it was decades before I told anyone about my experience. In the meantime, though, my NDE was giving me ideas that would change my life. I think this is my first effect of my NDE. My mom surely no noticed how my behavior changed after the drowning. I'd been a very ordinary kid with school by day and our small screen black and white TV by night. It was the Howdy Doody show and Kukla Fran and Ollie both puppet shows with a dash of Hopalong Cassidy that mostly had held my attention. But not long after my drowning, I found myself fascinated with the night sky, and I wanted to learn more. Suddenly, my favorite treat was a trip to the Hayden Planetarium in New York, and I prevailed on my parents to get me a reflecting telescope. Instead of TV, I could be found in the backyard on a clear night checking out the Pleiades, Jupiter, Mars, and the craters on the moon. 
Each year I do a blessing of our hospital's pet therapy dogs on October 4th, St. Francis Day. And reflecting on St. Francis recently reminded me that my seven-year-old experience of absolute love had some lifelong setback lessons attached to it as well. Jesus warned his disciples, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves, therefore be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. NDE visions of pure love are the innocent as doves revelations the heart welcomes in, especially as a child. And it took the brain's capacity for shrewdness a while to catch up and then even subvert for a while the heart of the dove. My love of the night sky inspired me to expand my horizons. With some spare lumber and time after school, I started to build a structure behind our one-car garage where the noise and lights of the house were minimized and I could be alone with my telescope and my thoughts. My very minimal structure, which I called my fort, was soon knocked down by a gang of kids a few years older and bigger than me who lived on the next block. I patiently rebuilt it, only to find it wrecked once again. Then one day, a few of the kids came into my yard saying they just wanted to be friends. One came up to me with his hand out, and when I offered my hand to him, he gut-punched me hard in the stomach. I had never been hit like that before, and the betrayal of it, of the what-a-fool-I've-been response was more shocking even than the nausea. They ran away after that, but the weight of their attack left a momentary lesson on my brain to compete with the learning lesson on my heart from my NDE. As a consequence, I was afraid to go back into my own backyard at night, afraid they might come back, beat me up, even destroy my telescope. Yet I still yearned for the night sky and my time alone with it. But now I needed a way to control it. Finally, in a burst of inspiration, I took over an empty attic room and turned it into my own planetarium. I hit the local appliance store for refrigerator cartons to build a cardboard skyline around the edges of the room uh, with Christmas lights wired to a transformer to create the changing sunsets and sunrise. A projector from the Hayden Planetarium gift shop provided the stars, and I would write scripts for shows about supernovas, comets, meteor strikes, and the creation and end of the world. My mom was usually my only audience. She would come to the attic, patiently stretch out on a mattress on the floor, and humor me in my involvement with the stars. The snake and dove introduction to my life affected me in other ways as well. I had been diligent in memorizing my catechism for Catholic Sunday school. Now my classmates were amused by the ruler wax to the back of my hand from the enormous nun who was regularly displeased by my failure to recite the catechism lessons for the week. The questions were interesting. Why did God make me, for instance? But the answers, God made me to show his goodness and to make me happy with him in heaven, were simple-minded to my NDE way of thinking and hardly explained why I was down here with the snakes and nuns if he really wanted me up there with him. NDE had other effects on me, too. As I said, my NDE fired my natural curiosity to an active passion for exploring the big picture. In the shadow of my father's advancing career, my public high school was traded in for a boarding school near Pittsburgh, attended by white upper-class boys headed for Ivy League colleges and professional careers in law and medicine. I found their privileged attitudes annoying, and teamed up with two like-minded friends who would, with me, sneak out of the dorm some nights and drive to a jazz bar in Pittsburgh's Hill District, a black neighborhood where we never got carded, heard some wonderful live world-class jazz, and came to appreciate a culture our more privileged classmates never knew. I found myself as features editor of the school newspaper writing a lot of satire on the pretensions of our school. One fateful day, I wrote a piece about a teacher I knew they'd never allow me to publish. I figured the story could be told, however, so my roommate and I broke into the mimeograph room, 
ran off enough copies for every student and placed them in the chapel hymnals in time for next day's service. That morning, when the dean said, rise and turn to hymn number 103, chaos ensued, followed by a week's suspension for my roommate and me. But the chaos made it, made, made it all worthwhile. Somehow I survived and graduated. I was due to start at Columbia University in the fall, and my father, perhaps remembering his Depression-era exposure to the Bowery, gave me $50 and a bus ticket and told me to get used to New York before classes started. So New York City proved to be the next great adventure. With the 50 bucks mostly gone, I found a job at a sweatshop in New York City's garment district where I pulled orders and pushed racks for $39 a week. I could afford to eat at the Horn and Hard Automat, where a few quarters would buy enough to almost fill you up, and I moved into the Chelsea Hotel, which was transitioning from beatniks to the folk music set. A few weeks later, I moved into the McBurney YMCA across the street, which was cheaper by far, $2.50 a night, cleaner, and had a free swimming pool. The pool was great for cooling off after my summer hot sweatshop work. The problem for me was the place was full of middle-aged gay men in pursuit. I kept my distance, but learned from their obnoxiousness what life must be like for young girls getting hit on by older men. Most evenings after work, I spent hanging out in Greenwich Village, making one cup of coffee last so I could stay for the music. Feeling uh, fully secure in my no fear of death NDE, I had no problem exploring Manhattan's neighborhoods, even Central Park by night, where the homeless, it seems, climb into the trees to sleep. Everything was cool. Come fall, my businessman father insisted I major in economics, but I spent most of my class time with humanities, including Gregorian chant and Eastern religions my favorites being Buddhism and Tao. For science, of course, I took astronomy. In retrospect, I credit those eye-opening choices in education to my NDE. I decided to join the Delta Upsilon fraternity, possibly the most despised fraternity at Columbia, <laughs> because the members were all renegades, misfits, and broke. Once I was initiated, they quickly voted me in as the treasurer because they said I was the only one they trusted. Our only apparent sources of income were the membership room rentals upstairs and a soda machine that produced an avalanche of change each week. <clears throat> one member I recall who had no money at all slept for free in the basement floor, wrapped in a parachute to keep off the rats. But the major source of income, as it turned out, was an old alum, George Gillette, who financed our 14th Street Brownstone frat house with what we guessed was money from the Razor fortune. Our membership was unique on campus for truly hating the very concept of fraternities. We had a few toga parties, but our hearts weren't in it. It was, after all, the 1960s, and so we decided to vote our Columbia chapter out of existence. We planned to do it in style, however, and on fraternity weekend, we entered the all-frat competition with the best decorated float and the most gorgeous and brilliant of frat queens, a friend of mine named Kate King, who went on to become a professor of comparative literature and classics at UCLA. The only reason she agreed to play this role was because she hated fraternities as much as we did. After we won the competition, we contacted the National and closed the DU chapter at Columbia forever. After graduation, my dad dearly wanted me to earn a Columbia MBA. I got into the program, took one semester, but then dropped out to go to work for the New York Department of Welfare. I trained as a caseworker and was assigned to West Harlem. My past history in Pittsburgh's Hill District proved good background for that. My winter vehicle was a 1951 Buick Hearst with a white racing stripe uh, up the back, while my summer preference was an ancient BMW 250 motorcycle. My caseload clients were black, elderly, and ailing, and in those pre-Medicare days, they needed the city's financial support to pay their hospital bills. I was there to help them when I could find them, 
Addresses were vague, made worse once inside the unlit hallways of those ancient Harlem buildings, and the numbers were also often missing from the apartment doors. These folks, my clients, usually had nothing to do uh, to their names but uh, pain and poverty. Nevertheless, they were the kindest, most generous, and loving group of people I had met. It was another eye-opening education in my life, and a job choice I now attribute to the urgings of my NDE. Another NDE effect was camping through Europe and the Middle East. By now, I was married to Allison, who dropped out of Bryn Mawr College to have our baby, Matthew, and share in the adventure of New York. We decided to save every nickel and eventually put together the $2,500 needed to buy a VW camper in Germany. Our parents called us crazy for attempting to live for a year in foreign countries, camping with our three-year-old on $5 a day. Of course, I blame my enthusiasm for the trip on the underlying influence of my NDE. We took a low-fare coal freighter to Hamburg, picked up the camper, and camped on roadsides through Europe and the Middle East for nearly a year until our money ran out. We were most interested in visiting pagan and Christian religious sites, cathedrals, crusader castles, mosques, and Greek and Roman temples in Turkey, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, and the Arab old city of Jerusalem. The year was 1966, one year before the 67 war, and if we'd entered Israel proper, the Israeli stamp on our passports would have kept us from driving back the way we had come. We climbed the Temple Mount, the third holiest site in the Muslim faith, where they believe Mohammed ascended into heaven, perhaps via an NDE. There we visited inside the beautiful Dome of the Rock, and stood staring down through an opening in the floor at the rock itself. The stone is purportedly the altar where God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. An angel stayed Abraham's knife, and yet 2,000 years later we couldn't stop ourselves from kill, killing God's son. God can wait millennia to score points for irony. It was January, and the weather turned cold in Jerusalem, so we camped by a spring near the top of the Dead Sea. There a Bedouin boy, a goat herd, tended his flock and let Matthew play with the goats. All seemed peaceful until a black Cadillac limo pulled up and two guards with automatic weapons jumped out. When they saw we meant no harm, they opened the back door and outstepped Habis Majali, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the Jordanian Armed Forces. It turned out we were camping on his land, but everything was fine once he realized we were American. He invited us to dine with him and to watch his horse win against the other contenders at his track. It turned out his horses always won. One of his particular favorites had been a gift to him from Jackie Kennedy. When his driver returned us to our campsite, the general gave us his card and told us, If anyone gives you any trouble, just show them this card and you won't be bothered anymore. The next day, one of his captains, a Captain Curdy, came by and took us to see the caves where the Dead Sea Scrolls had been discovered. With no Israeli passport stamps to block us, we were free to travel through all the Arab countries. From there, we went to Petra, where we rode horses through the long, narrow passage into a rose-red city cut into the cliffs millennia ago. As spring came and we worked our way slowly back to Europe, a wonderful pause in camper living came as a, at a med medieval French priory, once a stopover for the Templars. Allison's great uncle had inherited the building from his deceased wife, but never visited there. He arranged for the caretaker to let us stay as long as we wanted, and we did. Mornings, we'd walk our wine jug to the local tavern to be filled and buy two loaves of fresh-baked French bread. The year was 1966, but life there seemed more like a setting from 1266, with occasional autos passing through. Another argument for reincarnation to my way of thinking came from how much at home I felt there. A tower connected to the priory now lay partially in ruins, but a story lived on that a 18th century French poet had lived there in the tower for a time. I made up my mind I'd live in a house with a tower myself one day, 
And that's where I broadcast NDE Radio from today. Back home in Philadelphia, we found a rundown Victorian house to renovate while I pursued a promising publishing career and Allison finished getting her Bryn Mawr degree. But then, partly influenced, no doubt, by some judicious experimentation with LSD, we decided to sell the house we'd worked so hard to restore and buy an overgrown farm I'd discovered in Castine, Maine, complete with collapsing barn, a house with a ghost, an outhouse for plumbing, and 22 acres, all for $9,500. We named it Fern Hill after the lovely poem by Dylan Thomas, restored the fields and farmhouse, planted a large garden, set up a roadside vegetable stand, and then helped start and edit an organic farming and gardening magazine called Farmstead. We raised goats, chickens, pigs, bees, and added a quarter horse, Rusty, for Matthew and daughter Kristen to ride. We'd gained a lot of unwanted attention when a friend wrote us up as Alternative Lifestyles Number 17 in Family Circle magazine. And we blame that in part to some extent on why we, my plan to be a farmer writer and why our marriage ultimately failed. Farming can be brutally hard work. And while Allison thrived at it, just the work of cutting 10 cords of oak to heat the farmhouse here every winter proved too much for me. I mentioned our resident ghost in the farmhouse, so let me tell you about him. We knew he was there almost as soon as we moved in when we heard footsteps upstairs and doors opening and closing. When it happened, the hair on the dog's neck would rise and she would bark. We soon learned the ghost's name, Albert Webster, when an old man down the road, Oscar Butler, who'd known Mr. Webster as a child, told us his story. It seems Mr. Webster survived a Southern prisoner of war camp and returned from the Civil War to build the farmhouse for his family. Unfortunately, he'd been shot in the throat during the war, and the wound never fully healed. We found evidence of his ongoing pain in the cocaine-based medicine bottles buried in the old backyard dump. One day, it seems Mr. Webster had had enough, and when his family went down to the cove for a picnic, he took his gun to the back porch and killed himself. But that wasn't the end of the story. One day, as a violinist, violinist friend of ours did, named Danny Heifetz was practicing a Bach Chacon, he said he saw the old man's face suddenly appear, floating in the air. Danny kept playing, and Mr. Webster hung there to the end, but after that, we didn't hear from him again, and we hoped the music had led him to the light. Farming doesn't pay much, so when we ran out of money, I got my license to open a real estate office in Castine. Our goals grew apart after that, and after 20 years, Allison and I grew apart as well. She left to study nursing and to live a different life, and by that time, our son Matthew was married and living in San Francisco, and I was doing some summer stock theater. I met my second wife-to-be, Charlene, two years later when she choreographed a production of Oklahoma I was in. We eventually became editors of our local weekly newspaper, The Castine Patriot, where we editorialized, covered selectmen's meetings, and sold advertising. Charlene had studied ballet in New York and studied at Ballet Company in Ellsworth, Maine. We built a dance studio in Castine, where she taught ballet to the next generation. A good friend, Steve Carnes, my son Matthew, and I decided to build a house with a tower, where we live now, on the shore of Penobscot Bay. Since my time at the Priory in France, where that 18th century French poet had lived, I'd thought about designing a tower for living. I had a specific plan in mind, including a first floor for exercise, a second floor library, where I produce NDE radio, a third floor study, a fourth floor meditation room without windows, and a fifth level within a pyramid-shaped roof for stargazing and sleeping, with skylights facing the four directions. The pyramid shape was proportionately a smaller version of Cairo's Great Pyramid, which Charlene and I visited several years later. Then in 1995, Charlene and I decided to study for our master's degrees at Bangor Theological Seminary, 
And it was while confronting some of the problems with seminary scholarship that I wrote the first draft of my novel, Beneath the Phoenix Door, a story of two seminarians who go on to search uh, for the Garden of Eden. It wasn't until 1997, however, when I first noticed the worn for sale sign propped up in the overgrown yard of an abandoned Unitarian church. I was in my third year at the seminary, just up Union Street from the magnificent, dilapidated church. And out of curiosity, I called the broker. I'm so glad you called, she exclaimed. It turned out that the listing broker, Deborah Thompson, was also the author of a massive book on the city's historic architecture titled Bangor, Maine, 1769 to 1914, an architectural history. In her book, Thompson described in detail the Italianate design of this church, the Union Street Brick Church, adding the fine proportions of the exterior elements and careful detailing of this design results in what to me seems the best composed and most pleasing church design in Bangor. She insisted I look at the church interior right away. She confided there was another party interested in turning the building into three stories of apartments because of the tax advantages that come with restoring, in quotes, an historic structure. I could tell she was disgusted at the thought and delighted to hear I'd be pastor of the church along with my wife once I was ordained. But how could we outbid the other buyers? Well, the one holdup to the other party's plans for, was getting the city's historic commission to agree to tearing out the beautiful stained glass and installing apartment windows in their place. No one liked that idea, leaving me the only buyer. The Unitarians selling it were glad to see it reactivated as a place of worship and agreed to finance it for me as well. As I researched its history, I learned it was built in 1853 to replace the original Union Street Brick Chapel, which burned in 1851 under suspicious circumstances. It seems a new minister, Joseph Henry Allen, began his ministry that year, and his second sermon was described as quote, a bold assault on slavery, unquote. Shortly after that, the church burned down. I was surprised to read that prior to Reverend Allen, the renowned philosopher Ralph Waldo Emerson had been the church's interim pastor in the summer of 1834, following, followed by a fellow transcendentalist and close friend to Emerson, Dr. Frederick Henry Hedge, who pastored there for 15 years. Bangor's Hannibal Hamlin, who later served as Abraham Lincoln's vice president, was an active member of the congregation when the new church was finished. As we restored the building, I felt honored to become a part of such a rich history. With bricks buried after the original chapel fire, we built an outdoor circular labyrinth pathway over the old chapel site. I was ordained in 2002, and we started with a ragtag congregation of mainly musicians and actors. It happened that way on account of a weekly open mic we started, and the fact we devoted much of our time to spiritual theater as well. Uh, we did a passion play almost every year, a few popular shows like Godspell, and other plays my wife and co-pastor Charlene wrote and directed. Anyone who wanted could be in our plays. And uh, through skillful typecasting, Charlene proved anyone could be an actor. Over the following 20 years, we became a center for community performances of all sorts, something I would encourage all churches to do. In 2007, the Christian Science Monitor published a full-page article in their international edition um, about the, our church's wide-open approach to building community. Another effect on of my NDE, much more closely related, was uh, that I became what the local hospital called the NDE chaplain. To, to help support the church, I took a job as hospital chaplain at Eastern Maine Medical Center, Bangor's major hospital. I was a chaplain there for 15 years, truly the most fulfilling job of my life, and I know the opportunity was orchestrated by my NDE. During that same time, I was working on my seminary doctorate in NDE studies and used NDE stories as teaching and healing tools um, for the hospital patients and staff. I made a point of visiting patients who had coded and then been resuscitated, and I heard many fascinating reports 
of visits to and from the other side. NDE stories also proved remarkably reassuring for those patients and their families facing death. I came to be known as the NDE chaplain, and whenever a staffer or a patient had a supernaturally related story to tell, they'd call me in. And then there's NDE radio. I'd had a radio background since college at Columbia's WKCR, and then as new age DJ at Maine's community radio station WERU. I was the NDE chaplain at my hospital, and yet it still took me another 11 years to figure out NDE radio was meant to be my future. I won't elaborate further on what, I, what a slow learner I can be, but if you want to learn more about NDE Radio's founding, my 2022 talk at the IONS annual conference in Salt Lake City is available on our YouTube channel for, for listening. Well, by now, I've told you more than you ever wanted to know about my life, but I, I intended it for a reason. The point is, for better or worse, an entire life can be influenced, even restructured around a profound, spiritually transformative event that took me less than a few minutes to go through. In my work as chaplain and on my NDE radio podcasts, I have archived interviews with hundreds of people who've had similar life-changing experiences as a result of an NDE or some other personal mystical event in their lives. Some of those people who wrote the Bible received less otherworldly spiritual direction than some of the NDEers I've interviewed. So I am convinced God is still speaking to us. NDEs are a primary channel for that communication, and that's another reason it's imperative that NDEers get the encouragement and support they need from chaplains, medical staff, families, and loved ones to enable them to tell others about their experiences. Almost every NDE or I've interviewed has agreed that they're, are, they are no longer afraid of death. But I think God intends more than that. The extension of not fearing to die means we should not be afraid to live and live fully. The novel I first wrote as a seminary project, A Search for the Garden of Eden, has been my goal over the, over the 81 years of my life. In this brief biography, I haven't mentioned where I've looked since my children have grown, but those places include a cavern under the Temple Mount in Israel, a trip up the Nile through Luxor and the Valley of the Kings, time alone with Charlene in the King's Chamber of the Great Pyramid, a pagan celebration of the summer solstice within the Circle of Stonehenge, a trip through the so-called Venice of Costa Rica, where our little boat cruise silently through the rainforest canals to sneak up on the amazing wildlife there, the underground churches of Lalabella, Ethiopia, uh, carved out of solid, solid stone, plus searching the art of the ancient illuminated scriptures now crumbling in Ethiopia's Orthodox churches. The pyramids of Teotihuacan, uh, Mexico, and the hills of Mariposa, where the Monarch butterflies cover the trees, the ground, and fill the skies all around. The beauty of the Carlsbad Caverns and its absolute blackness when they turn out the lights, walking in the labyrinth under the reds and blues of the rose window of Chartres Cathedral in France, absorbing energy from the red rock vortexes, Schnebley Hill above Sedona, Arizona, where I found my initials carved into an ancient tree and wrote my novel's conversation with the devil. Studying a snake charmer and visiting the souk mosques in Marrakesh, Morocco, discovering a witch's coven on an outside hillside overlooking San Francisco during a New Year's full moon, praying in the garden tomb in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, visiting the Blue Mosque and walking the path through the underground cisterns of Istanbul. The list goes on, and there's so much more than what I've seen so far. But my search for the garden is over because I realize that all this world is the Garden of Eden. I'd have recognized it sooner if we'd been better gardeners, but we have let it go to rack and ruin, and the God who is love is not happy with us on that account. Satan planted seeds of greed and power in the earth, but we are not meant to run away from these weeds, but root them out. That's another lesson from my childhood NDE. 
I may have failed as a farmer, but I still know that's what good gardeners do. Well, thanks for listening. If you'd like to hear this show again or any of our more than 500 archived ad-free NDE interviews, go to TalkZone's NDE radio site and hit the Past Shows button, or go to our YouTube channel, NDE Radio with Lee Whitting, where you can subscribe to and comment on the complete NDE radio library. And be sure to check out our NDE Radio Facebook page. Just search NDE Radio with Lee Whitting on your Facebook app. And listen next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern at Talk Zone for more NDE Radio. I'm your host, Lee Whitting, saying thanks for listening.